I'd say uh, sometimes the songs we sing are so true, <laughs> you know? Uh, hopefully all the songs we sing are true, right? And so but they just, they hit different sometimes and I'm just so thankful for his blood. I'm so thankful that he uh, took our place. Can I pray, uh, collect myself? <laughs> Jesus, you're so precious and you're so good. Today, as we open your word, may it penetrate our hearts. May it divide our thoughts and the attitudes of our heart because truly it is God-breathed. May it correct us and rebuke us. May it reprove us. May it guide us in righteousness. For your glory and your name's sake, Jesus. Father, I pray that this week, um, as we go throughout our week, Lord, that we could hide the word of God in our hearts. We would seek to please you, Jesus. We would seek to live a spirit-filled life of, of obedience to you, and we would find freedom in that. Father, use Luke chapter four today, Luke chapter three, to guide us and direct us, to be a a light to our paths. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, I was an English minor in college, and so I'll just say this out loud, I love grammar. Uh, My mom um, taught me grammar from an early age, and so I love to think about commas, this whole non-double spacing after the period has really messed me up, and so um, I don't know who came up with that idea, but I was like, this is awful. And so um, there was a naval wife who asked the church to pray for her husband, and this is what she said. John Anderson, comma, having gone to sea, comma, his wife desires the prayer of the congregation for his safety. However, someone left out the two uh, first commas. And so this is what it said. John Anderson, having gone to see his wife, desires the prayers of the congregation for his safety. And so uh, um, commas are important, right? I like to say, uh, say it like this. Everything teaches. Everything teaches, including our, our punctuation, including how we behave, how we approach life, how we approach work and play. Uh, It all teaches, and so sometimes we can get mixed messages from people, right? Like I'm sure his wife was just like, that was not my prayer request. We gotta think about the way we eat. I have three boys who are ravenous when they get to the table, like they've never seen food before. And Shelly and I are always like, hey, slow down. The food is not going anywhere. For those of you who grew up in big families, you're like, the food does go places. And so uh, um, the way we talk teaches, the way we behave teaches, everything teaches. The way we worship God teaches. The way we attend church teaches. The way we open our Bibles teaches. The way we don't open our Bibles teaches. If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, Turn to Luke chapter three. Luke chapter three, when you get there, if you'd say word. Uh, I know all of you aren't there yet. And so uh, you wanna, I know, it's a, we we preach expositionally here. So you actually know what's coming. So you're good, you're good, okay. I'm gonna do a Bible drill where I'm gonna say, turn to Habakkuk. And so all of you are gonna be at word, am I liars? And so, that will, this will let all of us know that, that you found the right book in the chapter when you say word. Um, this is the word of God. And this morning, I'd like us to look at Luke chapter three and think about baptism. Why would the sinless son of God get baptized? I'm gonna give you the big idea up front. We're only going through two verses today, but we're actually gonna cover a lot of scripture. And so hang in there. Um, hey, are the lights fully up? Are we good? Okay, good. Okay, just making sure. Um, The big idea is Luke chapter three. Jesus' baptism reveals that he is God's son. He came to fulfill all righteousness and his obedience pleases God. Jesus' baptism reveals that he is God's son. 
and that he came to fulfill all righteousness and that his obedience pleases God. One more time. Jesus' baptism reveals that he is God's son and he came to fulfill all righteousness and his obedience pleases God. So if you have a, the scripture open to Luke chapter three, verses 21 through 22, I'm gonna read from the ESV is the translation I preach from. Verse uh, 21. Now when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Can we just take a few seconds and just marvel at this scene? You and I haven't seen something like this. This short passage is, is packed with instruction on how to follow Jesus, why to follow Jesus' example, and as we said before, everything teaches, every single phrase in these two verses, as does all of Scripture, teaches us, instructs us how to follow Jesus. People sometimes wonder why Jesus was baptized if he did not sin and had no reason to repent. Well, the other Gospels actually give us insight into this. Jesus' baptism is mentioned in all four Gospels. Uh, when you see something like this, you should just know this is a neon sign flashing at you to get your attention. When you see a story in all four Gospels, don't disregard the ones that aren't mentioned, but you should know that repetition teaches. <laughs> and God in his sovereignty included Jesus' baptism in all four Gospels. God is trying to make sure we see the significant in this event and he's gonna use repetition to do so. So I'm gonna read through a couple of those passages. I listed all of them on your sheet if you wanna do some further study. Matthew chapter three, verses 13 through 17 says this. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. The verse I'd like us to focus on is verse 15. It says, Jesus explains to John that he must be baptized because it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. I read a commentary this week. It was very helpful to me. I'm gonna quote it a couple of different times. It's by a guy named Tabidi Anabile. He's a pastor up near D.C. But he wrote a commentary on Luke, and this is what he said. The Lord Jesus Christ came into the world to fulfill all the righteous requirements of the law. We have broken all all those righteous requirements. Here stands Jesus in our place, not just as our sin bearer, but also as our righteousness. All that active and positive obedience we owe God as his creatures, the Lord Jesus provides perfectly, even down to his willingness to be baptized by John for the remission of sins he had not committed. Make sure you catch that last part. Jesus was not being baptized because he had sinned or would ever sin. On the cross, though, Jesus took our place as our sin bearer, which is why 2 Corinthians 5, 21, a lot of you know this verse. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Aren't you grateful? So this way I'm gonna to try to sum up these verses right here. Jesus gives us the righteousness of God because it was his to give since he is God. While he was human, he fulfilled all the righteous requirements of the law. All to the T. Jesus gives us the righteousness of God because it was his to give since he is God. While he was human, he fulfilled all the righteous requirements of the law. So that's one of the reasons that he was baptized, because he told John, I want to fulfill all the righteousness 
that I can fulfill. John chapter one, verses 29 through 34, and can is a bad word, that he needed to fulfill, okay? John chapter one, verses 29 through 34, it's the other passage out of one of the gospels about Jesus' baptism. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I am baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. Just a quick note. He, he says he was before me even though John the Baptist was older than Jesus, right? So he's saying something about the man walking toward them that they aren't, they aren't catching what he's throwing down. Are you with me? Okay. I'm speaking some language of the day, right? Listen to the rest of this verse. That he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the son of God. Anybody listening there that day should have realized this is the one who is coming to take away the sins of the world. This is the son of God. And John says right there that he might be revealed to Israel. John chapter one, verses 29 through 34, records the baptism of Jesus. Jesus participates in this baptism so that he might be revealed to Israel. That Jesus submitted in order to demonstrate to Israel that he is the savior that they had awaited. And they had awaited in silence for many years. And at, at his baptism, a confirmation is given of this in heaven. Flip back to Luke chapter three. Records the Holy Spirit taking the visible form of a dove. It says, like a dove descending on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it says, then the voice comes from heaven saying, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. So can you picture the scene? The, the father calls out, he sends a dove and then he calls out vocally from heaven to testify that the child about who there had been some question is indeed his son. In family Sunday school this morning, uh, one of the things it says, isn't this Joseph's son? <laughs> so who is his father? God calls out, that, that's my boy. In case you were doubting, this is my son, John just told you he's the son of God and I'm confirming this vocally that he is my son. Tabidiana Bile also wrote this. Don't you love that name? I wish I had a cool name like that. And so um, Christ Jesus, who had been the father's son from all eternity past, will be the father's son for all eternity future. And Christ who is God's son incarnate, that means in the flesh as a human, fully God, fully man, is the son who pleases his father. Do you wish to know what delights God? It is his son. The father looks at the Lord Jesus Christ who has come into the world to take the place of sinners and he concludes, this son of mine pleases me. This is a, a humbling passage if you know the end of the story, right? He's announcing that he's the son of God who's come to take away the sins of the world and the only way to take away the sins of the world is to die a sinner's death on a cross. And he who became sin so that you and I might become the righteousness of God. This is why all those who are in Christ by faith also have God as a father who is pleased with them. The father looks at the faithful and he sees his son. Look at verses 21 through 22. The fullness of God in all three persons of the Trinity unites in revealing Jesus Christ as God's son and Israel's savior. 
The fullness of God in all three persons of the Trinity unites in revealing Jesus Christ as God's Son and Israel's Savior. And so, in case you're just like, what are you talking about Trinity? Let me just kind of give you a quick uh, reference to this. As Christians, from the Bible, we believe that there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And they're three in one. This is my best illustration. It's gonna blow your mind. This is all I got, okay? Three in one, okay? Three in one. Three and one, three and one. Uh, no one has ever presented an illustration to me of the Trinity that it's the illustration of water doesn't hold up because they don't exist all at the same time. But my three fingers are existing all at the same time, right? And so uh, the Trinity kind of blows our mind. And so this morning when we talk about it, I just want you to know that it is very important to the Christian faith. God the Son is baptized. God the Father speaks from heaven. God the Holy Spirit descends on the Son in the form of a dove. Belief in the Trinity is one thing that makes us Christian. The historical Christian church has always understood the Trinity to be foundational to who God is and foundational to the faith. So those who deny the Trinity actually deny the Christian faith. They deny who God really is and by that denial prove that they do not know God. Let me try to wrap this up with Romans 6, 1 through 4. Not the sermon, I'm not wrapping up the sermon. Hang in there, okay? <laughs> what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. This is what a lot of pastors, when they uh, baptize somebody, well, they will say, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life, right? So what is baptism? I just want you to know I'm gonna spend the rest of this time talking about baptism because we are a Baptist church. If you've wandered in here today and we believe it is, it's one of the two ordinances that we celebrate with the Lord's Supper. And so today is gonna feel a little bit more like teaching. And so just hang in there. I pray that you would have a teachable heart about this. What is baptism? Well, baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo and on which our word baptized is based. It means to dip or plunge something completely into a liquid. New Testament examples of baptism imply that it was done in immersion. Immersion best fits that imagery that we just read of union with Christ in his burial and in his resurrection, according to Romans 6, right? An outward profession of an inward confession that God has raised you from the dead. So I, I believe that baptism is a beautiful picture of the gospel. When we baptize people, that's what those shutters are over there in case you've been coming for a while and you haven't seen them opened. We have a baptismal pool behind there. So one of our favorite things to do is ask people to read their testimony before we baptize them. And for those of you who are freaking out right now, going, I'm out, I do not want to read my testimony, we, we can read it for you, okay? So you, you stand in there, and then we uh, read your testimony about how Jesus saved you, which includes the gospel, the good news that God sent Jesus to die the death that we deserve and to resurrect so that we could have power over sin and death through him by placing our faith in him. He is our substitution on the cross. So, Baptism is a beautiful picture of the gospel, buried with Christ in his death and raised from the dead to walk in newness of life. And so when you come out of the water, you're raised to walk in newness of life. I'm gonna give you two definitions. One's a little more robust than the other. Uh, so the first one is simple, okay? In case a lot of you are like robust, why, why use this word, okay? Baptism is a believer's act of publicly committing him or herself to Christ and his people by being immersed in water. Baptism is a believer's act of publicly committing him or herself to Christ and his people by being immersed in water. 
So as Baptists, we believe that baptism is for believers. And it's done by immersion. But you need to really focus on the part where we believe it's for believers. Let me give you a little bit lengthier of a definition. And this one comes from um, a book that's similar to this. Actually, it was in this book. It's called, Why Should I Be Baptized? Now, we have a bunch of uh, question books out there that ask some church questions. If you ever want to get one, they're free. You might walk past them all the time and think, are those free? They're free, okay? So this one is, why should I be baptized? If, if we run out of those today, I got a couple more right here. And I have one right here. I'd gladly give it to you so that we could talk about it later. Bobby Jameson gives us a little more lengthy of a definition and actually connects it a little more, a lot more actually to the church. Baptism is a church's act of affirming and portraying a believer's union with Christ by immersing him or her in water and a believer's act of publicly committing himself or herself to Christ and his people, thereby uniting a believer to the church and marking off him or her from the world. So... What I'm, I'm going on a limb here. I'm going to tell you what I think, okay? This is the, one of the reasons that I think baptism should be saved for the church body. That if you're at, uh, away somewhere and you're like, um, I, I think I'd like to get baptized, and you turn to your buddy and go, hey, can you baptize me? Um, there, there's a disconnection between you and the church there. This is why I also don't believe that if I was at summer camp and, and there was a child that is like, I want to be baptized right now, that I'd be like, hey, can we wait till we get back to our body of believers where we serve? What I'm saying right now is my opinion. I want to make that clear, okay? But what I also want to make clear is that there is a direct connection between us and the body where we come on a weekly basis, it kind of steals it a little bit from us. If you come back and you're like, I got baptized over there, and you're like, well, how, how, are, how are the people over there going to hold you accountable? How are they going to cheer you on to righteousness when you go back during the summer? Which is possible for that one week. But what about the people here? Amen. That we use this word a lot around here, alongside, we want to come alongside of you because brother and sister, you need someone to come alongside of you. How do I know that's so true? Because I need somebody to come alongside of me. I desperately need people coming alongside of me on a daily basis, checking on my heart. Fortunately, Shelly lives with me because she's my wife. <laughs> and so we, we often have some heart conversations Often, pretty much probably on a daily basis. And you know, if you live with somebody long enough, they can kind of read you. <laughs> so if I come in and things aren't good, my mom can even do this. She was here a couple of weeks ago and I came in the door kind of discouraged and she was like, what's wrong? And I was like, I just walked in. <laughs> Stop reading me. And so, uh, but isn't it beautiful to know somebody? To have somebody that you trust that can go, ah, things aren't good. Something's not happening right in your heart. Some of you disguise your feelings a little bit better. And, uh, you might want to pray for that. God, I, I need to let my guard down with trusted people every once in a while and just let them really know what things are going on in here. So when Bobby Jameson gives this big definition that I put on your sheet on purpose with no blanks because I wanted you to be able to take it and think about it. Hey, uh, this sermon is probably going to provoke some questions, and so I expected that. I spent quite a bit of time this week just trying to put this together in words that we could understand so that we could all be on the same page. And also, when you walk out of here, you'll know what Cross Point Baptist's beliefs on baptism are, and then we can have further conversations. Okay? So, why should I get baptized? Why should I get baptized? Number one, to obey Christ's command. To obey Christ's command. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 should sound familiar. We say part of it uh, at the end of every service. 
And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So Jesus gives one main command in here is that's to make disciples. He gives three supporting instructions on how to make disciples. And this is the instructions. Number one is to go. He says, go, whether that takes you across the street, across the states, or across the world. He says to go. Number two is we baptize those who follow Christ. If you have repented of your sins and trusted in Christ for salvation, and if you have not been baptized as a believer in Christ, then I would say you need, you should be baptized. Baptism publicly identifies someone as a disciple of Jesus. So that's why Jesus' parting instructions to his church are actually very clear. (laughs) He says, make disciples. How do I do that? By going to the nations, by baptizing those who follow Christ. The Christian life is more than following commands, but it certainly isn't less. There is freedom in obedience, as we said last week. Number three, instruct new disciples to obey every one of his commands. How do you know those as a new believer? Because somebody Titus 2-like comes beside you and says, hey, have you thought about this? Have you looked at these passages in scripture? I was just having a a conversation with a brother in the coffee area up in there about prayer. (laughs) And so he encountered a coworker and and they had some different beliefs on prayer, but this is a great opportunity to open up the scriptures. And I just said to him, I said, some people have not read them and so therefore they don't know them. Therefore they practice something that doesn't look anything like the Bible. So we're to make disciples and baptize and teach. When we become a follower of Jesus, we want to give our whole life to him, trusting him, following him, learning and obeying his teaching, following his example, and Jesus' example is perfect. So so why should I get baptized? To obey Christ's commands is, is the first one. The second one is to publicly profess in Christ. To publicly profess in Christ. Acts chapter two, verses 37 through 41. Now when they heard that this Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of his apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all those who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized and they were added that day about 3,000 souls." Just as I said at the beginning, commas are very important and commas are not in the Greek translation of the Bible, but let me just point one out right here. It says, the promise is for you and your children and for all those who, all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And then verse 41, all for those who received his word were baptized. So you have, to, you have the ability to receive his word. Because we believe that baptism is a a visible, tangible, public, dramatic expression of faith in Christ. It's obvious, it's memorable, it's even dateable. You could say, on this date, I was baptized after I had become a believer. You get soaked and everyone present sees you disappear under the water and reappear out of the water. It's a very public act, right? For those of you who've been baptized, you get totally wet. Ladies in the room, your hair gets totally wet. I've never seen a lady go, not my hair, okay? Um, Colossians 2, 11 through 12 says, in him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands 
by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you also raised with him through faith, in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Colossians 2, 11 through 12. I'm throwing a lot of scripture at you today. I'm expecting, hopefully, that you will write it down and maybe look at it later, okay? In these verses, Paul singles out baptism as a sign of conversion, but he doesn't just refer to baptism. He says, in which you were also raised with him through faith. Paul assumes that faith was present at the time of baptism because faith was the reason for baptism. Faith in the resurrection power of God is why those Christians presented themselves for baptism and publicly expressing that same faith is why you should be baptized too. Number three, to formally commit yourself to Christ and his people. To formally commit yourself to Christ and his people. We've seen that in baptism, you commit to Christ. Now we will see that in baptism, you commit to Christ's people. Acts 2.41 says, so those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So were they counting people? Yeah. They had a good idea that it was about 3,000 souls that were added to the church that day. All those who received Christ that day were received by the church. And the way the church received them was by baptizing them. And so then I would know Hey, you just came out of the water, right? Hey, you just came out of the water. It was visible. This is, this is a great reminder to us is that we want to see each other and know each other and be known. In baptism, believers bind themselves to Christ and to each other. In baptism, you commit to Christ's people. For some of us, we may have never thought about that or heard that, but I, I wholeheartedly believe that. Everybody's eyes up here real quick. Jesus left the local church and gave us the Holy Spirit because he knew that long ranger Christianity did not work. <laughs> Jesus, the Son of God, traveled with 12 men his whole life, right? His whole ministry, okay? I, I, give you, I don't know much about his teenage years, okay? But when he started ministry, he gathered some men around him and he said, let's go and change the world. If you think the Son of God wasn't teaching at that time, at that moment in his life, everything teaches. You and I desperately need people around us, checking on us, coming alongside of us. In baptism, you commit to Christ's people and we commit to you. So what's your next step? When you are looking through this and you're like, Jesus' baptism reveals that he is God's son, he came to fulfill all righteousness, and his obedience pleases God. And you're like, Tim, that's a pretty good argument for why I should get baptized if I am a believer, if I have repented of my sins, if I have trusted in Jesus as my savior, but I don't wanna get baptized because... So I'm gonna give you some of your reasons in your head, okay? Number one, I've already been baptized as an infant. I don't want to get baptized because I've already been baptized as an infant. Many uh, Christian traditions practice infant baptism, but they have radically different reasons for doing so. I'm just going to give you one of them this morning. And once again, uh, this is a conversation. I'm not trying to make, um, I'm not trying to argue here. For instance, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that baptism confers saving grace and removes the stain of original sin. It's in, their, it's in their teaching. It's what they believe. That's a drastically different understanding from what I just described. There are no clear instances of infant baptism in the New Testament. 
There are some things that maybe you could say, well, the whole family came and you're like, well, what if they had babies? That's a lot of what what ifs there, okay? I think if Jesus wanted us to baptize babies, he would have got baptized as a baby. But he got baptized when he was 30. And so uh, I understand this is difficult for some people to understand, but when you're reading scripture, you just have to always think, Holy Spirit, I need you to instruct me. I have a pre- presuppositions that I, bl- I bring to scripture all the time. I'm asking you to tear those down because every facet of baptism's meaning presupposes the faith of the one being baptized. Jesus commands his disciples to make disciples and to baptize those disciples. Baptism baptism is a public profession of faith, Acts 2. In baptism, you commit to Christ and his people, which is something only a believer can and should do. Number two, I don't want to offend my parents who had me baptized as an infant. Um, I had this conversation with several college students when I was doing college ministry, and I've had it with adults. If your parents had you sprinkled or, or what their church called baptized as an infant, and you have come to the belief that that wasn't baptism, you should think of how to communicate your new conviction and your intent to be baptized to your parents. You should do so respectfully and humbly. This probably isn't what you want to bring up as soon as they're carving the turkey, right? Hey, I got something to talk about while you got the knives out. Um, You can express appreciation for the way they raised you in the discipline and nurture of the Lord. And you can pray they will understand that you have a different conviction now and pray they will have joy that you are trusting in Christ and seeking to obey him in everything. When I talked with college students about this and they had been raised in a denomination or another a place where they were sprinkled as a baby and they would come to me and we would have this conversation and really towards the end of the conversation somewhere I would say, I said, so you're telling me you're a college student and you're walking with Jesus in college and you've read the Bible And you've seen what it says. And because your your parents don't believe that your baptism is the same as theirs, they're going to be disappointed in you. I would just say that's that's a lot, right? Are y'all okay out there, Amanda? Okay. Rachel, would you go with them? Thank you so much. Or Tammy, if y'all want to tag team it, okay. Um, College students, just like adults, it's hard to walk with Jesus. And I think this is a conversation you can have with your parents, where you kind of can say, hey, this is what I've come to believe and I'm choosing to do this now as an adult. Number three, my non-Christian family will reject me. My non-Christian family will reject me. For many believers around the world today, even here in the United States, to publicly embrace Christ is to risk being completely cut off by one's natural family. We, we should remember that this kind of rejection by family is exactly what Jesus said would happen. I'm gonna give you two passages. Matthew chapter 10, verses 35 through 37. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Following Christ is costly, but it's always worth it. When we lived in East Asia, 
Um, and even in Alabama, um, I had the opportunity to baptize some Chinese believers. And a lot of them realized when I make this public profession of faith and if my parents find out about it, we're, we might be, just be done. There are places in the world where you'll, you'll just be killed. And so we wanna, we wanna, we wanna walk beside someone and, and, and comfort them with the scriptures to tell them that Jesus is not surprised by this. Mark chapter 10, verses 29 through 30. Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. So, if, if you know somebody whose family is threatening to disown them because they intend to be baptized, I pray that you will have the courage to encourage them as they walk through this to obey Jesus and not abandon them. We should, we should come alongside of this kind of persecuted believer to let them know that we are the family of God. Number four, I'm afraid to tell everyone I'm a Christian. When well, today's climate, telling people you're a Christian can lead to ridicule, opposition, losing a job, losing a friend. Matthew 10, 32 through 33 says, so everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. You and I should not be afraid to tell people that we are Christians because he saved us and he's worth it. Number five, I've been a believer for a long time. Isn't it too late? <laughs> All right, it is not too late. <laughs> Jesus' commands to be baptized is binding on all believers, which means it's binding on you. Whatever your reason for not yet obeying Christ's command, none of those are good reasons for now refusing to be baptized. It's not too late. I've seen very uh, young people and old people and everybody in between. Number, number six, I don't wanna join a church. I don't wanna be baptized because that's gonna lead to church membership. To many people, even churchgoers, church membership sounds uh, too much like organized religion. It's too formal. It's too authoritarian. I hear that a lot when we're talking about our membership process here at Cross Point. Some churches baptize people without mentioning a word about church membership. However, I, I believe well-intentioned that is, such churches are doing believers a disservice and pulling apart what the Bible keeps together that they were added to a people, uh, a, a church. In baptism, you not only commit to Christ, you commit to his people. So at, at Cross Point, we believe church membership matters. We believe in meaningful church membership. We often say that phrase, we are family. We take this seriously. We wanna take care of each other. We wanna come alongside of each other. We wanna labor until we have no more breath with our brothers and sisters to say, I want you to pursue holiness and I'm gonna pursue it beside you. We are committed. The church is the bride of Christ and you and I should love her. Yes. But what about, I ran out of reasons, uh, and so, there may still be some questions lingering in the room. I'd encourage you to pray about them, search the Bible for answers, discuss them with a pastor or another mature Christian that you trust. However, if you're sitting in here this morning, you're thinking, I want to get baptized. I have never thought of it like this. Maybe no one's ever preached a whole sermon on baptism and you're just like, oh my goodness, that's a lot of information. Maybe today you would say, I've never understood Jesus' baptism and why I should follow him in believer's baptism. Well, I'd encourage you to come and find me today. Maybe you just wanna scan that QR code on your phone and type that in and just say, hey, Tim, Eli, I'd really like to talk about this. From what you've described today, this is very important in scripture. 
We want to be a church that cares well for people. That's all of our cards on the table right there. We want to be a church that cares well for people. And we want to know you. If you come here today and you're like, I I don't want to be known, I pray that you would change your mind about that. Because when you get in a little bit close, you're going to see that we've got our junk back there too. (laughs) If you knew what God knows about me, you probably wouldn't want to come hear me preach. And if I knew what God knows about you, we might not let you in. (laughs) Okay? That was a joke. Okay? Everybody lighten up just a little bit. Okay? The grace of God is so, so sweet. And all of us need it. We want to be a people that are gracious to each other. But we also want to hold each other up when we're weak. We want to come alongside of each other. One of the ways we can do that is why when people get baptized, we can listen to their testimony and how God has brought them to this point and then we could cheer them on as they come out of the water and then we could come alongside of them and say, we're with you. This is what a church family looks like and let me just say it to our military families in the room. This is not in my notes, so here we go. Shelley always tell me, stick to your notes, Tim. No matter the the shortness of your time here, I would tell you to move your church membership over and over and over again. If you're here for like six weeks, I might give you a little bit of a pass. If you're here for six months, that's a long time. If you're here for a year or two, that's a super long time, even for people with gray hair, right? Move your church membership. Let a people come alongside of you and know you. Will you pray with me? Father, we exalt you today for being a good God. We thank you that you um, know us and love us and that your word is good for us. Lord, baptism is a sensitive issue and I've... I've not tried to make light of any of the reasons not to get baptized today. And if that has come across in any way, I repent and confess before all of these people. I think baptism is a beautiful way to publicly profess your faith in Jesus. And it's a beautiful picture of the gospel for believers, for people who have repented of their sins and have trusted in you and said, Jesus, I want to follow you. And Jesus, I'm so thankful in your final instructions in Matthew 28 that you told us to to make disciples and to go and to baptize people and to teach them how to obey you. Father, we want to be true to your word. We want to be a people that are true to your word. Lord, help us to have teachable hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.